Before I start the video, I would like to give a massive shout out to my Patreons who have been supporting my channel. If you would like to check out my Patreon and receive early access to some very exciting videos coming soon, then please click the link in the description below. Hello there and welcome back to the Just a Nerd podcast and today I am joined by a very, very special guest. If you'd like to introduce yourself and explain what you do. Uh, my name is Finley Robertson. Uh, I played Larry Nightingale in the uh, Doctor Who episode Blink. Okay, well, welcome Finley to the Just a Nerd nice podcast. To have me. Nice to have me. Thank you. Nice to be here. It is an honour to have you here. Now, it is a safe assumption that you're an actor, right? I am, that is correct. I am an actor. I was an actor and still am an actor. Yes, all of these things are true. So, with your acting career, what inspired you to get into that career path? Um, I think it's sort of... I think it's a thing where um, nobody ever begins. Well, maybe a few people do, but I think acting is a thing that comes out of playing as a kid and... Uh, make believe and all those sort of games and that moment where you see i think that people can respond to you that you can do it you know you can make people laugh or you can capture people's attention and i think um the more you do that and the older you get and then you realize that you fall in love with doing plays and and making films and storytelling um and then that just kind of takes you on a journey and then at some point you go I'm, I'm going to go for this I really want to do this and that's that's kind of how it was for me really oh that's very lovely to hear and it's always nice to learn you know as, as, you know especially when someone gets you know more experience in their field of work you know what inspired them to you know get into that and it's especially... I mean I think for me the inspirations were always kind of the films I watched as a kid you know yeah. Star Wars films and nice I really loved the Muppet show as well and there was a thing about the Muppet show there was a kind of showing off craziness up front and then there was also behind, you know, backstage and it was the backstage dramas and the idea of a company full of um, different characters somehow coming together that made it work. Those were the things that kind of um, got me going. And then I did plays at school and then, you know, just got the got the bug, really. So when you, you know, I, I guess got into acting, you know, any, anyone can say, OK, I, I, I want to, you know, try and, you know, get into this field of work and, you know, start applying for roles. But where do you feel like in your career where you feel like, okay, this is what I am and I feel like, okay, I can make something of this? I think I think the first time you, um, you're you able to pay the rent, yeah. <laughs> the thing, really, because it's all well and good. And lots of people look, you know, the vast majority of actors have jobs outside of acting and doing yeah. other things. So, you know, I think as a career, you you – you say I can do this when you can kind of make it work yeah. and you're you're you feel okay saying I am an actor and then you and then that's kind of how you have it. Lots of people have kind of either old fashioned or sort of uh not appropriate ideas of what it means to be an actor, but it's really yeah. hard work, even when you're not acting, when you're not working. It's a really it's a real struggle, you know, auditioning yeah. and there's that thing where if all you ever look at is a, is an actor's kind of output, then you don't see all the auditions, all the line learning, all the classes, all of that that's behind that. So it's very much a kind of tip of the iceberg. But yeah, I think though that's the moment where you go, I'm, I can pay my rent and, I, and, I, and I'm where I want to be and I'm enjoying it. That's the thing where you have to say, yeah, I, I'm all in. This is this is for me. Oh, that's uh, really interesting to hear because, I, as you said, you know, um, like the main thing is, you know, like making a living, you know, paying for your rent, being being able to, you know, put food on the table and stuff when it comes to, yeah. you know, any, any job really. But um, yeah, you know, acting, you know, it's such a, you know, like a, well, I guess not really, well, it, I, I guess it is a grind because at the end of the day, yeah, because you've got to go through the audition process and then obviously, you know, with filming and, you know, preparing yourself mentally for a role dependent, you know, m maybe compared to, you know, of, other roles as well you might have to mentally prepare yourself even more depending on what the role you're taking as well so yeah. i've always been curious to know as well especially from an actor's perspective how do you prepare um for a role uh, once uh, you've got uh it? the first thing you you know you think first thing you you remember is that your job as an actor is, is to serve the writing and the writer yeah so all the clues are in the writing and it's about how you can 
serve the character that is presented to you and then <laughs> add something creative to yeah. that, something on top of that. But the, the main job is is just to get inside the, the head of, of the character. And that just means reading the script and, and also just living life and yeah. and looking at other things, looking at all kinds of art, you know, paintings and films and uh, radio plays and music and kind of inhabiting um, storytelling yeah. and working out um, what it is that makes a person tick and and what it is in your experience that you can you can bring to that role and and how you can then collaborate with a director to to lift the character off the page i suppose so have you found with any of the roles that you've done on film and television uh do you feel like you've ever struggled at one point to really immerse yourself into a role or yeah i think felt... sometimes i mean obviously if you're playing somebody who's a murderer that, that yeah. can be hard and or um but you 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 find a way in you, i think you always have to otherwise you know if you're not playing somebody uh, if you're playing somebody whose life experience you you don't recognize or know you have to find a way actually if you sort of you know, I, I played a character and he, you know, worked in um, uh, forensics and lots of stuff with dead bodies. And I, you know, I've never seen a dead body. So I, you know, I wrote to a medical school and I said, can I can I come and sort of talk to you? And then, you know, we got there and then and then by the, you know, the end I was there was a dissection room going on. So there were lots of, you know, cadavers around and I walked around and I saw these and it kind of just fleshed it out. Yeah. No pun intended. Um <laughs> Just, so that that can be tricky, but again, it's 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 not always about living the life. It's about yeah. working out what what as a human being connects that person to you as a human being. Because I think fundamentally, we all we all function in a similar way, and we all have so much in common, no matter where we are, and no matter what our life experiences are, because of, because of the fact that we're human beings. And I think that's kind of what. It, it, I suppose it's finding the humanity. What makes this person a human being, and what kind of human being are they? And that, I suppose, whatever job they do, uh, is is more important. I mean, you have to get that right. You have yeah. to, you have to. If you're playing an airline pilot or a uh, guitarist or whatever, you have to know kind of what you're doing. But beyond that, what's more important than that beneath the surface is is what makes a person tick. I think. Yeah, certainly, and. Especially, you know, like you said, you know, about being human and stuff like that. Um, and, and you can see in many roles um, across various film and television projects is, you know, there's a lot of emotion involved, you know, especially like, you know, if you think of an, an emotional film um, or emotional scenes in, you know, film or TV, um, you know, you, you kind of feel at some points, you know, some empathy for the characters. And that's because of, you know, yeah. the actors that have, you know, like, as, as you said, you know, studied you know, the dialogue and kind of, you know, done some method acting as well, you know, understood, like as you said, you know, with murderers and, you know, stuff like that, you've got to understand, I guess, what makes them tick, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, method acting, when you're playing a murderer, I, there's only so far you can go. Oh, yeah, um, of course. But, but I think, yeah, it's what causes somebody to think murderous thoughts. And I think at all times in our lives, we've, uh, we've been so angry or upset uh, that, you know, those things have happened and you just have to work out what gets somebody from point A to point B, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's a very fair point as well. But I'm also very curious to know, um, because you've gone on with, with you know, your way of um, getting into roles, you've obviously had a very successful um, acting career. And I'll, I'm very curious to know, has there been um, any highlights from this uh, career that's made you feel proud to be an actor yeah i think i think you know yeah, we're talking about doctor i mean being part of that episode part of blink just because it meant so much to people i mean that's the yeah. thing you know you you do it for yourself and serving the writer and doing a good job but when you find a connection with an audience that's the thing and and when i go to conventions and when i meet doctor who fans the thing that's really apparent is is how much it means to everybody how central doctor who is to their lives and i think that is something when you're when you, when you, when the work you m make means so much to other people that's when you can go wow that's that's and that's on top of you know 
performances in plays where I, you know you say I've done a really good job or a couple of things in in TV shows where I've you know gone I was I was good in that I like I thought I, I really um, yeah I was really happy with my work I think those those feelings are one thing but when you connect with a with an audience and you create something that that lasts longer than you know the 90 minutes the 60 minutes that it's out there and it lives on that's when it really um that's a real highlight for me i suppose oh no that's really lovely to hear and as well you brought up the um the obvious mention of doctor who and especially the episode itself blink you know it yeah. aired in 2000 and yeah 2007 which you know yeah. is is a very long time ago but it's kind of had a cultural impact you know it introduced the world to the weeping angels and you know the whole don't blink um moment and stuff like that and the fact is, you know, that you as well, you know, you appeared in that episode as Larry Nightingale and you've been doing a lot of conventions recently. Did you ever feel like at the time, like, oh, you know, this this has caught on and that you'd be doing conventions? No, I mean, at the time, it, you know, at the time, I have to say, it's just an, it's another acting job. You're aware of the of the, the sort of culturally what it is. And, and I, yeah. Doctor Who was really a big part of my childhood, you know, Peter Baker and then David, Peter Davison, um, Tom Baker and yeah. Peter Davison. Um, but, uh, and at the time I knew it was a good script. I knew it was an idea. It was only when I saw, when you're out, you do a thing called ADR, which is called additional dialogue recording, where you go in and you, you either, you either add new bits of dialogue that make the cut work or you, or you re-record dialogue that wasn't quite captured on the day or some words have been rewritten. And when I saw the cut, yeah. of the of the end uh the end sequence and then i went oh wow this is really exciting and then i saw the whole episode on a i guess it was a kind of a podcast with andy Pryor, the casting director and it uh it was really it was really only then that i went oh wow yeah, yeah. this is really really good so that was when it first began to um to sink in i suppose Oh, OK. That's actually really cool to hear as well, because obviously, you know, in post-production, as you said, you know, with like stuff like ADR, yeah, that's, I'm guessing, you know, the f possible first time you'll go back and look back yeah. at, uh, you know, your time filming, un unless, you know, you don't do ADR, and then you'll obviously see it, I guess, at previews or <laughs> on TV. But let's do a little bit of backtracking, and to when you first got the role as Larry in yeah. Doctor Who, what was your reaction? I know, what did you... Right, yeah. I was just really happy because I'd, I'd done a couple of auditions. I did an audition first, and then they wanted to see me again, but doing it in the accent that I did in the show, because they'd cast Lucy Gaskell, and they really wanted her to do it, uh, and they thought it would be better if I matched her accent, so they wanted just to check that I could do it, and I went back maybe once or maybe twice to do it. So it was it was more of a sense of, whew, it would have really hurt if you go to all that effort and it, yeah. and it hadn't worked out. <laughs> so I was I was really happy and relieved in a way. Uh, and then it was just about learning the lines and working out how to do it. And uh, and it was only, you know, it was two weeks work. It was two weeks away from home. I, I, I came back a couple of times. Um, but yeah, it was basically, you know, get on with the job. Yes, yeah, that's actually really cool to hear because obviously when it comes to, you know, like you said, you know, getting the role in the whole audition process, you know, it can be tough. And, you know, especially when it comes to where, you know, the unfortunate case where you don't get a role. Um, I am, again, curious to know from an actor's perspective, um, how do you feel when, you know, during the unfortunate case where you don't get the role? Like, do you... you uh, yeah, you just have to, you just have to if it if it meant something to you if you really wanted yeah. to do it you have to find a way of kind of grieving for it yeah and then letting it go yeah. otherwise you would go mad yeah. uh particularly when it when it comes out there's a there's a story i think it's uh, matt damon and ben affleck tell this story about how they uh were young actors and they were just starting out uh and they both got quite far down the road of uh, the casting process for Dead Poet Society, um, this fantastic film in the sort of early 90s. And they didn't get the part. But then that summer, the job they got was working at a cinema. Yeah. And the only film they were showing that summer was Dead Poet Society. Oh. <laughs> so they would be taking the tickets and then watching the audience coming out going, oh my God, it's the most amazing film I've ever seen. <laughs> and that, I think, is a really a tough gig. Um, 
but look, you have to, you just have to do your best and 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 let it go and learn from it. And and if it's somebody, you know, if you're really at ease and at peace with yourself, you can say, okay, fine, I did the best audition I could do, and I told them this is how I would do it, and I gave yeah. an account. And if they didn't want me, then it's right that I don't do it. You know, there's a big yeah. Brian Cranston thing where he says, you know, you're you're not going for a job, you're doing a job, and the job you're doing is. If you want me to play this role, this is how I'll do it. That's my job. Okay. And if they don't want it done in that way, then it's good you don't do it. You're not right for that job. And if you can somehow hold on to that, uh, then that really also helps. But it's uh, it's just, um, and it's not a rejection either. I think that's another, you're not being rejected. I mean, you, you, you're, you're just not right for that thing. It's not, they're not saying you're not good enough. It's just, you're not appropriate for that role they they see it differently or they want somebody with a different look or yeah. or whatever it is and those are the things that kind of long term keep you sane and healthy yeah I, and again as well you know um especially you know as time progress um there's a lot of campaigns as well for like mental health awareness and obviously you know that feeling of rejection and you know especially when it comes to trying to find work as well you know yeah. it, it it can put um, you know a lot of mental strain on yourself but you know the coping mechanisms that you just stated there as well and kind of I guess looking on the bright side is important I think also it's remembering that you can't if you define your value as a human being by your success as an actor yeah. then you'll go insane it's a really <laughs> toxic even if you're really successful uh, you know you're many other things apart from an actor you're someone's best friend or you're someone's brother or sister or boyfriend girlfriend wife or someone's father you know those are the things or somebody's the best person that somebody wants to play football with on a wednesday night or the person that you know someone goes to when they're in trouble or all those things those are the things that that make you who you are not whether somebody has said yes i'd like you to play this part in my tv show so those are the really important things to hold on to i think yeah that's definitely um a very important message and whilst we're on the topic of um you know how to you know deal with um you know that negative side of acting and stuff and you've given some really good advice there but i'm curious do you have any other advice for upcoming actors i mean i think the thing is i, I say what you know i teach i teach screen acting and i teach a lot of particularly young actors and i say it's about finding your tribe finding who makes the work that you want to make and then working out how you can make it, whether that's in the theater in, uh, uh, or, or in television or in British films or American films, and just immerse yourself in the culture and see as many things as you can and work out who your allies are and what you can learn from them. And, um, and yes, keep in mind all those things I said about... Um, your sanity and and the best actors are not the people who all they do is take acting classes yeah. um the, the the best actors bring the humanity of their lives through uh looking at paintings and listening to music or being engaged in politics mm. they bring that to their to their work as an actor and that uh that is what makes a, a well-rounded uh actor who makes really interesting performances. Yes. No, no, that's co completely fair as well, because, you know, again, you know, immersing yourself into the role and kind of tapping into human emotion, it's very important, but it also as well keeps things grounded. And obviously from mm -hmm. you know, an actor's perspective, you know, they are still human themselves. So you don't want to be, I guess, going to extreme lengths, you know, to potentially, you know, hurt yourself emotionally. And stuff I think, like I that. think the thing, the, 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 one of the key phrases is, is, Take the work seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously. I yeah. think that helps as well. You know, we're making films and art and television are important in yes. society. Storytelling is what unites us as a species. Yes. But it's not delivering babies or saving people from burning buildings or, mm. you know, finding a cure for cancer. Yeah. You know, those are the important things to hold on to. Yeah, 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 exactly. And I guess, you know, I, you know, when it comes to 
you know, when, when you're filming and you're on set and, you know, there's going to be times where, you know, you forget your lines or you say the <laughs> wrong line stuff and you'll feel like, oh, you know, like today's not my day. But I, I guess it's always important to imagine in some cases anyway that, you know, like as you said, you know, don't take yourself too seriously and just to, I guess, try and enjoy yourself a little bit as yeah, well. Exactly. And, and, and um, you know, it's another saying, you know, uh, if you're happy, you work more. Uh, and I think you need to find a happiness and a contentedness and a joy in life. And that will be reflected in your personality yeah. and your performances. And that will make you ultimately, I would suggest, more successful. And actually more people will want to work with you because you're not stressing about whether you're any good or not. You just or X, Y and Z. It's uh, and it's finding the, the things that give you joy outside of acting and the work and auditioning. That, that make you ultimately a better actor, I would say. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, keeping yourself happy, obviously people will see that. And then, you know, I, I guess as well, it, it contributes towards, you know, uh, providing a more positive workplace to work in as well, um, which, you know, will make, you know, other people working on it, whether that be uh, people working in front of the camera or behind the camera, you know, it just helps, mm. you know, make, yeah. make people stay for sure. Exactly. And I think, you know... Um, when you're on a film or a TV set, yes, you're the person on camera, but you're not the most important person in the room because you um, you know how to do your job, but but I don't know how to do light the scene. I don't know how to record the sound. I don't know how to organise so everybody's in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Um, so we're all in that moment together, creating that raw material for the filmmakers, the director and the editor to serve the writer so yeah a happy set where everybody is happy and working together will always yeah make the best work exactly exactly but let's obviously go back to talking about you know the um set and you know working mm -hmm. on um a certain show called doctor who uh, do you have any memorable memorable moments whilst working on doctor who uh, i think for me the memory was uh it was really cold <laughs> Oh, okay. filming in this sort of half abandoned house with open windows and it was quite I think it was November time it was pretty October November and it was a night shoot so we went through the night so it was pretty cold um so it was hard I mean it was hard and then behind the scenes obviously we had these statues that were there were angels that were statues and then there were sort of half a dozen people who were um street performers or, or, or gymnasts who were able to control their body really really well or dancers and they were, you know, that was quite strange, seeing somebody who you thought was a statue suddenly begin a conversation or eat a sandwich or something. Um, and then I do remember the day when we worked outdoors with David. It was right at the very end. And suddenly I got a sense of, wow, this culturally, this is a, a phenomenon. Just the short, the sheer number of people who were um, coming up to him and, and wanting him to sign stuff or handing him paintings and drawings and stuff that they'd done or you know um instagram and twitter weren't around but people did have cameras on their mobile phones and there was yeah. just that constant sort of so it was like um getting him to and from set and then getting him from the location and then in between setups you know it was like we were sort of hiding a rock star he had to sort of hide in the in the shop so he yeah. wouldn't be mobbed um and i think that's only uh, that sense of um, protecting the 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 lead actor on Doctor yeah. Who, I think, is is only increased in intensity oh, yeah. as the show's success has uh, has skyrocketed. Yeah, exactly. And obviously, with you know the success of the show, you know, only you know going up. And as you mentioned about stuff like Instagram and Twitter, the use of mm. hashtags, um, especially when it comes to Doctor Who as well, you know. I mean, there's always um, filming locations uh, before, you know, the filming actually takes place. People are able to, you know, find out because of, you know, like uh, no, notice boards and yeah, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, so you did bring up as well that that's one of the moments where you felt like, wow, OK, I'm starting to understand, like, OK, this, mm -hmm. this, this is a big thing. So after the fact, you know, after your episode was broadcast, how did Doctor Who have an impact on your uh, acting career? Uh, 
I mean, in, in in many ways, it was it was it was just another job, you know, because it was the one episode, and and you know, yeah, you know, I think if you know the characters had come back, if uh, uh, Larry had come back, then it, then it might have been. But you know, it was it was it was just another job, and it has this life where it 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 um, it is a really important thing, and people know me from that. And interestingly, people who are who are now casting directors, who were younger, who were sort of fifteen, sixteen now, who are now they saw it. So I sort of existed in their kind of childhood. Yeah. Um, and that's really nice. Uh, <laughs> I, I do get a sense of people wanting to see me because that's where, you know, that's what I represented to them, which is kind of weird, uh, but lovely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, that that's really, you know, it's only when it's sort of, uh, it exists in the, in the stream of, of, of being, uh the cultural thing it is for those people but outside of that you know ultimately it it, it becomes just another acting job and it becomes something you're proud of um but you just kind of where's the next job what's the next job where's the next audition so yeah. so that's kind of how it works no that's uh very interesting to hear um especially you know because she says while she only appeared in, in one episode it was a very iconic episode and did end mm. up becoming as we mentioned earlier kind of a part of like British culture because of the whole yeah, um, yeah. concept of the Weeping Angels as well, especially yeah, yeah. was such a terrifying concept. Um, but you did recently end up reprising the role as yes. uh, Larry in the video game sequel to Blink called The Lonely Assassins. What was it like reprising that role? In... It was lovely. I mean, it was it was lovely. I watched the episode again. I hadn't watched it in full for a long time, and I just tried to get into the character and the voice, and you know, made myself sort of scruffy again. And then it was just <laughs> nice hearing the kind of uh, what happened to Larry in in there in the in the game maker's imagination. Um, so yeah, it was it was it was really nice. It was a uh, it was it was really nice, and it was um, we filmed it while COVID was happening, so it was yeah. quite tough with sort of masks and lots of tests here and there and everything. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was just a really nice kind of reprise and return to the character, like visiting an old friend really yeah. you haven't seen in ages and um, and just spending some time with him. Yeah, because like, as you mentioned, obviously, you know, working on set, you know, during the COVID lockdown and even yeah. after, because you know, there's obviously still some um, health and safety measures in mm -hmm. check. <laughs> um, and obviously, yeah, that can make things harder. But also you were working on a project which had like a slightly different format as well, because. Um... Yeah. I mean, I, I don't play lots of video games or indeed any video games, but it was, I, I, I had my sense of the story and I uh, did my scene, but I wasn't aware of everything else that was going on or anything else that was going on. So it was kind of, um, uh, it was kind of a surprise and, and really exciting. You know, it's the normal, you know, when you get a, normally when you get a, uh, not always, but but normally when you get a a part in a thing, you will have access to the whole story and the whole script. But this time I, I didn't, so I didn't really know what was going on when I shot it, which in some ways was 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 great because I could play that uncertainty with with genuine honesty. Yeah. Um, but uh, it just meant that when the the project was finished, yeah. engaging with it was um, was really really nice. No, the, yeah. It, again, you know that whole uncertainty about you know what's going to happen, especially with your yeah. character as well, because uh, Larry uh, up until that point hadn't uh, reappeared in the main show. So no. you know you you were probably going in into it thinking, "Blimey, are, are the angels actually going to finally get me?" Is like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know. I mean, that, again, that is a. Uh, it did bring back that idea, and um, yeah, it was very easy to play that terror. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And again, it goes into the whole you know tapping into the emotion to uh bring that out in your performance which um i can imagine is probably you know does make it a little bit easier yeah exactly exactly it does it really does so um before we wrap up finley yes. um i've got a few questions from my audience um right who are very eager to ask you some questions Massive. so i've selected about four to um okay kind of uh go through things so Please. The first one um, is from Adam the Ultimate Whovian on YouTube. And Adam asks, if you could get to perform in a different role in Doctor Who, what would it be? Would you be the Doctor, the Master, or a villain? I think I'd like to be the Master. Okay. I, 
I think uh, I think having that sense of uh, the only uh, the only baddie, the only monster, the only nemesis of Doctor Who who keeps coming back because yeah. Doctor Who can't quite yet sort of finish him off, I think uh, would just be a lot of fun. So, yeah, I'd love a go at the Master. Um, yeah. No, that's a really good choice as well. And again, with the Master, uh, you know, there's so many different portrayals as well that have happened. Um, but the main thing with the master is that yeah they are kind of insane and they do some you know terrible things, horrible like, things yeah and um i guess you could kind of um you know studying that um you know that personality you know that case study you know it yeah it, it would be a certain certainly interesting role to play yeah they're always the fun roles because you yeah. get to do things that and imagine doing things that you really would cannot do in real life so um yeah. they're, they're a lot of fun lots of actors love playing baddies and uh it makes a lot of sense oh, it's, it certainly does but for the next question from the spider crafter 8547 uh they ask did the weeping angels terrify you on set uh no no i honestly because it um and that's you know you you got to show but but the they looked terrifying, some of the pictures, and the idea of them moving and you can't see the eyes is terrifying. But really, the terror comes from the cut. The terror comes from them being suddenly be cut back and suddenly they've come somewhere else. And then also the terror of the idea of them. Yeah. The fact that they could be all around you and the fact that you couldn't see them come up on you or attack you because they move so quickly. It's the it's the concept yeah uh that is the most terrifying and that's why i think they're the most successful that because yeah. yeah it, it's always the ideas because you they can return to you in the middle of the night or they can re you, they're, they're much harder to put to bed or put in a box uh that's what makes them scary and then in the actual moment yeah it is the cut we cut from there to there and then mm -hmm. suddenly something's changed and they're a lot closer so that that's the main scariness yeah the scary the the aspect of terror yeah in, in there and as and, and and to be honest like as you mentioned with you know like you know the different cuts and especially the moment in the episode where the weeping angels is practically right in your face and i'm guessing mm. during the close-up shots you're told not to blink is is, is that something that's yeah they just let the camera roll and you would just kind of keep keep it going for as long yeah. as possible you would just you know stay well hydrated and you know if it was if you were struggling not to blink that was that made for a great moment you know that <laughs> was oh i really want to blink but i can't um yeah yeah because I, I can imagine as well like, when you know you read the scripts or you're told on set not to blink you, your mind just kind of wants to do the opposite exactly i'm doing it now because <laughs> I said it and i realized i haven't blinked in a while so yeah exactly yeah that's always something that i've i've found you know when someone tells me that but let's move on to the uh penultimate question and that is from um tj981 and they have asked what was one of the best things to do whilst working on doctor who i think the best thing to do was uh to it was just lovely talking to david and david was there and it was it was just lovely being caught up in his kind of orbit he's He's a lovely man. He's incredibly charismatic and kind and just uh, was fun to work with. And I've seen him a couple of times since then. And so it was just it was just really nice working with a really great actor who's a who's a really nice guy. I mean, that was that was uh, that was the most fun. That was a really, really fun part of the job. Definitely. No, I, no, I, I can imagine as well, um, you know, working with you know someone that, you know, well, you enjoy working with. You know, it's yeah, uh, yeah. again, as we mentioned earlier, you know, it provides, you know, like a happy workplace, a bit more positivity. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it just makes the job easier to do. Exactly. Which... Exactly. So um, we're going to move on to the final question now. Sure. And this is from John457. And John has asked, do you like the fact that Blink is a Dr. Light story where obviously the Doctor's barely involved, uh, making the episode feel more unique? Or would you have preferred to be be in a more conventional Doctor Who story? Uh, no, I think it being the, being the setup it was with the Doctor Light is, is what makes it, and that makes it 
more fun. And, and the reason it happened was they were they were shooting two episodes at the same time because of the schedule. So it was impossible for David to be in it any more than he was. I mean, he's in yeah. it a bit, yeah, but he's not the main driving force. That's um, uh, Carrie Mulligan's character, and 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 that, um, yeah, I think that is that that makes it mm, the writers had to be more creative, yeah. and I think it allows it to exist and be viewed in its own special bubble outside of the um the doctor who universe so i think that's that's it's exactly as i would have wanted it its own sort of doctor who story but its own individual um standalone concept and idea that's yeah that is the best for me yeah and that's um, a very good point as well because blink as well it, it it's got a different type of format um the mm. main star isn't the doctor and yeah. I guess a lot it allows audiences or to be honest, even newcomers to the show, they can just tune into that episode specifically because it doesn't have any ties to any other previous episodes. Yeah. You can just jump on and kind of just get 45 minutes of angels that can move when they're not seen. I think that is yeah, such a lovely it's, thing. It's a standalone episode and you're right. It makes it accessible to, to anyone. Uh, and that's what makes it, that's one of the reasons it's, it's so special, I think. Exactly, exactly. But I am going to wrap things up here. So, Finley, thank you so much for coming on uh, to the More than podcast. welcome. Uh, very has... nice to, to see you and to be uh, here with you today and to answer your you and your uh, customers, viewers, uh, what lovely questions. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it has been a delight. It's been nice as well to hear, you know, what it's like from an actor's perspective on so many different things. And, yeah, it, it, it does, you know, even if you're not an actor, you know, just being, you know, dealing with you know sometimes you're not going to get a job and sometimes you know things aren't going to go the way you plan but get, i guess you know providing a more healthier mindset it can just you know it, it can make any day a lot easier which is an exactly. important message exactly yeah so yeah thank you all for tuning in uh at home if you're watching listening thank you all for tuning in and we will see you all next time and again thank you to finley for tuning in and yeah see you all next time Bye-bye bye bye for now bye